Okay, so what we have today is an addition to what we've already been doing. So again, what we have today is not something new, it's something additional. Um, so what we're gonna look at is using this acronym CPCTC. So first off, what we need to recognize is what this stands for. So CPCTC stands for congruent, or sorry, corresponding, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So if we think back to the very first part of our unit, before we even got into proofs, if we knew that triangles were congruent, we could pull out corresponding angles, pairs, and we could pull out corresponding sides and we could say that those pieces themselves were congruent. So again, your CPCTC stands for your corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Um, so here's the thing. When you are going to use this is when you are asked to prove your parts, the parts could be either segments or angles, asking to prove that those parts are congruent. Now. The very first thing that you have to do to be able to use CPCTC is that you must prove first, okay, you first have to prove that the triangles themselves are congruent. So again, what you're gonna look at, and I'm gonna repeat this several times today, what you're looking at is exactly the same thing as what we've done before. You have to prove the triangles are congruent, and then you're gonna use this additional step to get beyond that, okay? So let's take a look. So I did a little bit of pre-work on this. I went ahead and filled in our givens to try to save us a little bit of time. So if you need, go ahead and write those givens in. And the very first thing that we're gonna do is the same as what we have been doing. If we look, AB grew it to AD, there's nothing else I can get from that. It's straightforward so I can mark it. Um, same thing with the second piece here, that BC is congruent to CD. Nothing else I can get for that so I can mark it. Now, if I look at my picture, I can see that my two triangles share that side, AC, and so AC is congruent to AC. Anytime we have that shared side, it's the reflexive property of congruence. And so now I can go ahead and mark that. When I look at my picture, I now can recognize that by side, 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 I can say that those two triangles are congruent. Now, at this step, we definitely want triangle congruent to triangle, but we have to come up with a congruency statement ourselves. We cannot just copy it down from our information in the question like we did before. So A of the triangle on top is formed by the two sides marked with two and three, so it's gonna match up with A at the bottom. So A matches up with A, B corresponds with D, and then our C corresponds with C. So now that we've proven those triangles are congruent, this opens the door that we can pull out any corresponding pair, so corresponding angles or corresponding sides and state they are congruent. So now I can go ahead and prove exactly what I'm supposed to try to prove, that the two angles at C, BCA and DCA, appear in our proof. We can say that those two are congruent and our reasoning would be the corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, so again, everything, to recap, everything from step one to step three is exactly the same as what we've been doing. Then we have to just take that additional step. So if we look at the next question, again, I went ahead and did the given already. Um, the first thing that we're gonna look at is PS is parallel to QR. So if PS is parallel to QR, what we can look, use is that Z going on in the middle. Again, when we look at this, we cannot just call that top angle S because there's multiple angles at that vertex. So we can call that PSQ, and it's congruent to the angle down here at Q, which is going to be named RQS. And again, anytime we have that Z or the N, that's because of the alternate interior angle theorem. And again, if we didn't have that word theorem, that's not the end of the world, okay? So we have those two angles. Now, we also have this information in our given that's straightforward, so I can mark that. So QPS is the angle at P, SRQ is our angle at R. So I have those two angles that are going to be congruent. 
The other piece of information I can get is from my picture, I have this shared side through the middle. So again, if it's a shared side, I could say QS is congruent to QS by the reflexive property. Okay, now just a quick reminder, it is the reflexive, not the reflective. Okay, we're not looking at reflectors. Um, it's a reflexive. And so now if I look at my two triangles, I can say that those two triangles are congruent. I have two angles, so I've got an angle here and an angle here. This side is not between those two angles, so it's angle, angle, side that tells us that triangle, and again, we have to come up with our congruent statement. So we have P, S, Q, you can write that one however you want, but P corresponds with angle R, S corresponds with angle Q, and then we have angle Q of that top triangle corresponds with S of the bottom triangle. Again, steps one through four, exactly what we've already been doing. Step five is then going to open the door for us to be able to pull out either segments or angles that are corresponding. So now we have exactly what we're trying to prove, and we have the reasoning for that is your corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay? So again, it's not something new. Today it's something additional. All right? Okay, let's take a look at the next one. So again, I have already written the given down. If we look, X is the midpoint of WY. So if X is the midpoint of WY, what that's giving us is two segments. So we've got WX is congruent to XY. And so I can go ahead and mark that. And again, my reasoning definition of midpoint. Because that word midpoint tells us that that's a possibility. We also have that it's the midpoint of VZ. So if we look at VZ, we also have these two pieces. So you can either make this an additional step with the same reason, or because it is the same reason, we can go ahead and put those in the same step. That is personal preference, okay? There's no right or wrong way. So I can either both put them in step two, since they have the same reason, or I can make that step two and step three. All right, now the thing with this one is there's no additional information I can get from my um, given. So now I have to look at my picture. So again, if I look here in the middle, I see those intersecting lines, which tells me I have vertical angles. So this angle here, again, I have to use three letters to name it. So I have angle W, X, V is congruent to, and if I look at the other one, I've got Y, X, Z. So X is the middle letter of those two names. That is the vertical angle theorem. And so now I can go ahead and mark them on both sides. If I look at my picture, I have enough now to state using side angle side that those two triangles are congruent. Now, let me pause. Anytime I have side, 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 side angle, side, angle, side, angle, any of those five, the part that matches up with it is the triangle congruency. So sides, side angle, side, all of those, that proves triangles are congruent. So anytime you have those, make sure that those two things match up. So now I can go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to do X, W, V. X is going to correspond with X. W is, I'm going to move along the side mark with two marks. So that means I have to go along the side mark with two here. So X, Y, Z. And again, now that I've proven the triangles are congruent, I can now state what I'm trying to prove. I can state those angle pieces. Okay. So, I can state those two angles, and again, your reasoning corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, so hopefully we're seeing this pattern. We've got two more to look at here. Um, next one, again, I already did the given. Notice the first set of information that JM bisects angle KJL. So if I look at our picture, KJL is the angle at J. JM bisects it. So again, if we're cutting an angle, that means we're getting two angles. Okay, same thing. Cutting a brownie, we get two brownies. All right. So the two angles at J are going to be KJM, and the one on the bottom is going to be LJM. Those two angles here are going to be congruent. Okay. And again, the thing in our information that tells us that's true is the word bisects, so it is the definition of bisects. Once I have that, I can go on to the next set of information. So the two angles at M are also going to be congruent. 
Okay, so I have the two at J, I have the one at M, and the other one at M, and now that's all the information I can get for my given. So now if I look at my picture, I have that shared side again. So I've got JM is congruent to JM based on the reflexive property. Reflexive property of congruent. And now if I look at this, I've got the two angles and the side in between. So I've got angle side angle is going to prove that we have triangle and we can name the top one however we want. So KJM is congruent to K corresponds with L, J corresponds with J, and then M. And once we have that, then we can pull out pairs of sides, pairs of angles, etc. So we have what we're trying to prove that segment JK is the same as segment JL by your corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Last one. Last one. All right, so if we look at number one, okay, our, again, that is our given. We've got BC is parallel to EF. So we've got these two are going to be parallel. So again, I can use a transversal. The key is it doesn't matter which one you use. You can either use BF, or if you don't want to use BF, you could use EC. That doesn't make a difference. All right, so my first gut is to use BF. And so the angle at B is going to be congruent to the angle at F. Those are my two corners. And again, when I'm looking at that Z or the N, it's the alternate interior angle theorem. So I've got these two angles here and here. If I then look at D as the midpoint of BF, I've got D as the midpoint of BF. And so now I can say that BB is congruent to BF. And again, the thing that tells us that is the word midpoint. So it's the definition of midpoint. Boom, boom. And then I have some flexibility. So I could either use my other transversal to get C and E and do alternate interior angles again, or I could use the vertical angles in the middle. Okay, Whatever makes the most sense to you. So a lot of us probably see those vertical angles in the middle. And if we use that, we again, we have to use three letters to name that. So BBC is congruent to angle FEBE by the vertical angle theorem. Now, again, you could have used the other angles at C and E. That's fine. It's just going to look a little different. So all that to say this, there's more than one way to do some of these. Okay, so don't stress out if you think that they give you more information than you need. If we look at our picture, now we have the two angles and the side in between, the way that we've written it. So by angle side angle, I've got triangle uh, BBC is congruent to triangle B corresponds with F, B, and then E. And again, now that we've proven those two triangles are congruent, I can say that EB is congruent to segment DC, again, by your corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, so again, let me reiterate, this is not something new, it is something additional. So your first couple steps are exactly the same. You're still proving the triangles are congruent. That final step is an additional one, okay? So as always, guys, ask questions if you need it. I'm happy to help out. Hopefully this is all making sense and you're starting to see patterns. Thanks.